بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمد ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسأل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So the topic that I have been assigned in the theme of this legacy conference was to talk about the significance, importance of sincerity in leaving a legacy. So I want to start off by saying there is no legacy at all without sincerity. And I'm going to spend the next 15, 20 minutes making a case, sharing a point, and then coming back to the fact that there is no such thing as a legacy without sincerity. So folks, we are currently in the month of Muharram, right? The month of Muharram, it marks the beginning of the Islamic New Year. And then the year that it marks changes from 1444 to 1445. Now, whenever we look at Islamic dates, we see an A and an H at the end after Hijrah. Why was the act of migration designated as the epicenter for the beginning of the calendar of Islam and Muslims? In the era of Umar during his administration, either two and a half to four years into his administration, there was an issue that needed addressing came up. Umar would send letters and communication to his governors to give them instructions. And one governor received an instruction and there was a little confusion about which, for example, which shawal do you mean? Would you like this instruction carried out in the shawal of next year? Or the shawal that just passed? Like, did your message get to me a little too late? Or are you telling me to be ready for something one year in advance? And Umar was not a person you wanted to be on the wrong side of. If you were a governor. So this communication was made and Umar who summoned a meeting of the senior sahaba, of his close advisors of that time that look, we got the months down, but we need to figure out a system to start recording our years, which until that time wasn't present. Many, many suggestions came. One suggestion was, well, if you think about it, what brought Islam onto the map? The night of revelation, right? What brought, not al-Islam, but Islam, registered trademark, Islam. What brought that on the map? The night that Jibreel al-Islam came. The first revelation brought Islam to the world. So, if you look at it, it should start from there. If we're going to the years of Islam, we should start from that night. Yeah, but who received the revelation? When did he get into the map? Let's start with his date of birth. Opinions were given and it didn't satisfy the group and Umar didn't go with him. Okay. The saddest day in the Ummah. The biggest loss that the Ummah has faced which left us to be on our own to serve and fend for Islam. The death of the Prophet Let's count it from there. Yeah, no, you know what? That's going to be an issue later on. And do we really want to make the focus the death of the Prophet Nah. Ali anhu, he gets the credit for the following opinion. He said that why don't we mark migration? The act of hijrah. Let's mark the migration of the Prophet ﷺ as the epicenter of our Islamic calendar. And he 
made the case by saying it was the day in which God liberated Islam and the Muslims from the clutches of shirk and its people. It's the day that they got freedom. The single most impactful, greatest event that changed the trajectory of Islam was the act of hijrah. It's, it's the time when a small group of people scattered around in hiding in their tribes in Cognito, they went from being an openly, an openly recognized group of people. It went from when the Prophet ﷺ was only followed as a messenger by a few by a by a few hundred people whose ministry was not even acknowledged by the people around him. He went from being that to someone who was not just accepted as a messenger, but who became accepted by the citizens of Medina as their solemn leader, as the head of state. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala switched the situation of the Muslims. Now, after migration, it was not all smooth sailing. It's not like it was their move to Florida. No, the challenges only got harder as time unfolded. But it meant that they were allowed to act freely and call a place their own and their home and live life the way they wanted to, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had wished for them to. All right. Now migration, it came at a huge cost. What did it mean? What did migration mean? So migration, migration meant two things for different groups of people. If someone was already Muslim in Mecca and the permission for migration came, that meant that they had to leave. It was in their best interest to leave. It's time to go. Now, many of the Muhajireen did not have the luxury of putting up a for sale sign and liquidating all of their assets and expecting their properties and their wealth and their assets to be safeguarded in the event that they leave because they had to leave quietly. They had to leave under the cover of darkness. They could not announce their leave because their tribe would not let them leave. Their tribe would not let them leave. Parents, imagine your 15-year-old son or daughter comes and says, you know, I want to move out. Yeah, right, you're moving out. That's the mentality. Yeah, right, you're moving out. You're moving to Medina. Oh, no, you're not moving to Medina. So they had to leave under the cover of darkness. They had to go with whatever they could pack on a camel or a donkey or on their back, and they had to get, in the, get up in the middle of the night and leave. The Muhajirin lost everything. Most of the Muhajirin lost everything that they left behind in Makkah on top of their childhood memories, on top of their family relationships, on top of all of that, which meant everything. What was the single most, what was the structure of survival for the people in that area of that time? It was being a part of your people, being a part of your tribe. And if two tribes who are not a part of each other lived close to each other and were always under threat of each other, you know what would happen? Treaties would be made. They would exchange their daughters in marriage to sons to build an alliance. So that now at least we don't have to worry about robbing each other or killing each other. And us two can work together and fight off a third person. So being a part of your tribe was all what it meant to survive. To leave all of that behind. To leave all of that wealth behind and literally migrate across this desert. Crossing that border, going to Medina, not knowing what's going to happen, just on a promise. That's a huge sacrifice. And after the Prophet Sallallahu moved to Medina, anyone who accepted Islam, 
it meant that you had to pack up and leave. Hijrah, migration was an obligation on anyone in Makkah who accepted Islam. They had to move to Medina. You could not just, oh, you know what? You wake up one day, yeah, this deen makes so much sense. This is going to free me from the shackles of shirk and all, all these idolatrous beliefs. Let me accept God and Muhammad as his messenger. If someone had that feeling and did that, you had to pack up and leave. You got to join the rest of the group. You can't be here alone. Unless there was a valid reason that was holding you back. Later on in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses critiquing some of those who became Muslim and did not do migration without a valid reason. It was necessary until Fatih Makkah. When the Makkah, when Makkah was conquered, then the Prophet ﷺ said, La hijrata ba'd al fatih There's no need to move from Makkah now after it is ours, after the conquest. Anyways, long story short, the act of migration was such a heavy sacrifice. It is what made a group of people above the rest. The Muhajireen, they have a status and rank that is second to none when it comes to the ranking system of the Muslims. The Muhajireen, then everyone else. The Prophet ﷺ has stated in a hadith, compliments of Umar in which the Prophet ﷺ says, all deeds, all actions, all lectures, all worship, all hajj, anything that we do, all service to others, anything that you do, it is all based upon aniyad, the concept of intentions. And I'm going to get back to this phrase later. Moving forward, the Prophet ﷺ, when he gave an example of how important sincerity is to an amal, he gave the example of migration. <laughs> he explained that. Then he says, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Who is he talking to? He's talking to the group of muhajireen who this applies to. Whether it's those who moved when the Prophet ﷺ was told to move, or those who moved afterwards, they all paid this heavy price to be a part of the rest of the group in Medina. This was such a roll of the dice. This was such a gamble. Because if you think about it, at least in Mecca, yes, if I become Muslim in Mecca, my tribesmen will hate me, okay? They will hate me, but they still will not let someone from outside touch me, correct? But if I move to Medina, and the community in Medina were the underdogs, they were always, they were the minority. So it was such a gamble, such a sacrifice to be able to do that. Why? Just because there was, what, what incentive was there? What monetary incentive was there for the Muhajireen to accept their Islam and move to Medina? There was no monetary, there was no stipend that was given. There was no, you know, it wasn't, it, it, they weren't giving grants to people. Oh, you know what? We need to boost the economy of Medina. Let's, let's, uh, uh, let's uh, do um, uh, 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 tax. Um, incentive to move to Medina or all of these incentives a moving package you'll get a free plot to build on none of these things a person did this because they finally came to accept that you know what like imagine all of these like me looking at all of these chairs these are all idols around the Kaaba you know what I'm gonna all of this does not make sense to me there is one God I don't need any of these idols they haven't paid me back nothing in all of these years. I'm going to worship one God. And you know what? What Muhammad says, it's beautiful and it makes sense. And I think it's right. That's all it meant was a change in mindset. And they had to give up all of that for that. The Prophet ﷺ said, 
فمن كان الهجرة إلى الله ورسوله if you did that for God and his messenger then that migration counts as to God and the messenger because when they were going to Medina where were they going? to the messenger ومن كان الهجرة إلى الدنيا يصيبها Ha. If someone allowed this thought, if someone thought that, you know what? I have a business going on in Mecca. I sell swords. I sell buckets. I sell whatever I sell. If I become Muslim, no one's going to do business with me like a Muslim in hostile India. No one's going to do business with me. My business is going to go down. At least if I go and take my art, my talent, my craft, my assets, my inventory, if I take it to Medina and set up shop there, you know what? I get the deen and the dunya. The Prophet ﷺ shared this example. Whoever's migration is towards the worldly matter to obtain that, or imagine person in Mecca thinking, if I become Muslim, nobody's giving me their daughter. Right? And I ain't about to marry no Muslim either. So it makes a sense to go where you can find a single Muslim spouse. So you know what? This may work out better than Iman after all. I'll go ahead and move to Medina. Or another example of that. These two people in Mecca, they were looking to get married. They were engaged. And one of them becomes, the, the, the female becomes Muslim and then she has to leave. So now, he's heartbroken in Makkah that my girl left me because she became Muslim. You know what? Let me see what this Islam is all about. Let me read this Quran. You know what? Yeah, okay, I can deal with this. I become Muslim and I can move to Medina and be with my beloved. Or if his migration is to a woman, for him to get married to. Such a big sacrifice. Such a heavy deed. Such a significant rank and honor of being the muhajir. Such an impactful deed that it became the epicenter of our Islamic calendar. Anytime we look at the calendar or you look on your phone and if you have the Islamic date, I'm looking at my iPhone. Muharram 19, 1445, ah, oh. A.H. I am constantly, if there is any, any event in Sirah, that I am constantly being reminded of in my daily life. Or if you don't keep up with the day today, Islamic day, on a monthly. Or if you just figure it out on New Year's. On an annual basis, you get this slap on the face to remind you that hijrah is the thing that Islam is based on. Something so big, something so heavy can all be obliterated, can all turn into dust. It can all turn into cotton balls, cotton candy. If the intention was not for Allah, and that is what sincerity is all about. Khalis. Not 2%, not 1%, not 25%, not 50-50. Everything that we do as Muslims is to leave ourselves what? A legacy. That legacy means two things. A legacy either in the form of deeds that are written down on your book and are piled on your mizan of hasanat, what you actually do, 
what you actually do builds yourself a legacy, a spot, a plot, a mansion, a fortune in Jannah. But then there's also another side of our deeds that leaves you a legacy behind. And it's a deed that lives beyond you. It is a deed that transcends your existence. Which is what we call Sadaqa Jariya. Anything that benefits us after we die, that aspect of a deed is also a legacy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this in Surah, surah Yaseen. وَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارَهُ وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامِ مُبِينِ And وَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارَهُ We are recording what they have sent ahead. What do you send ahead? What do you send ahead? Your deeds into the hereafter. وَآثَارَهُمْ And the footprints that they have left behind. When we perform our deeds, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَةِ إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَةِ Going back to the beginning of the hadith. All Deeds, all actions, all acts of service are based on the intention. This can be understood in different ways. I'm going to share with you two filters to understand this phrase of the hadith. All deeds are based on the intention, meaning if they are done for Allah, that deed will be rewarded. If it is done for anything else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that deed will be based on that. And there is nothing and no one that is worth anything compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the greater. End of story. So our deeds are based on our intentions as far as the reward is concerned. Another way to understand this, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْنِيَاتِ Our deeds are driven by our intentions. They are driven by our intentions. When we do something, yes, it is an act that is being done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there are other intentions that can be sandwiched under the umbrella of wanting to do something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what being mindful in our intention is all about. What significance does intention have on leaving a legacy? The way, the, the, the mindset that we have when we do something for Allah, to bring that, to renew that, to constantly remind ourselves of that, has an effect on how your deed will shoot forward and stay behind as well. What do I mean by that? The Prophet ﷺ has told us to and encouraged us to smile. To smile in the face of your brother is a sadaqa. So one may smile. And the intention behind that is that I intend this for the sake of Allah. I am not smiling at this person because, oh, you know what? I know you. That's why I'm smiling. Yes, if you know someone and you interact, it puts a smile on your face. But to intentionally go to someone while you're crossing paths, someone whom you do not know, and to smile at them. Or to say salams to them with a smile on your face. The Prophet ﷺ has said that that is a sadaqah. So what? That got deposited into your legacy. But if you are mindful about the fact that why am I, what am I, what purpose am I doing this smile for? I came across this quote a couple of weeks ago. People will not remember what you say. People will not remember what you do. Okay? Think about someone who did us you know, there's so many people 
There's so many good things that we hear from other people. There's so many nice, courteous acts of kindness, good gestures that we experience from other people throughout our lives. How many of them do we really remember? There's just the big, big one that we remember, right? People don't remember what you say. People don't remember what you do. People remember the way you make them feel. Those big moments that you have, that you are attached to, was it because of the amount of money or amount of help or amount of support that was involved? Or was it because how you just needed that at that moment, even if it was something small and that resonated with you for the rest of your life? And I became conscious at once I was serving as a, when I was serving as an imam in New Orleans. <clears throat> there was this one person that I became really close with. He happens to be my accountant, my CPA till today. We're really close family friends. We've been for uh, 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 we've traveled together. We intend to go for Hajj together, like really tight. And when I was moving to Dallas, this was six seven years ago. You know, we were just with all of my friends. We're like, when was the first time we met? When was the first time you met? And he said that this is something that I held in my heart and I never shared with you. But I'm going to share this with you because you're moving. He's like, I moved to New Orleans from San Antonio, like whenever he moved. And he's like, for the first month, month and a half, no one, no one came and met me or said salam to me. And now he's a big shot over there. Now everyone, now he goes to all of the parties. But no one met me or said salam to me or had some type of menial conversation. I would just come in and leave. And he said, once I was sitting, leaning at the back, and you passed by, and you just sat down and like, hey, you asked me what my name was, how am I doing, this, that. And you just had this like two, three minute conversation with me, and then you had to leave. Ever since that time, I've had this, like his experience of coming to the masjid changed. And that's when I realized, was it, a, was it a migration? No. But it's to be mindful in our intention whenever we do something. Those are the things that could possibly leave a bigger legacy behind us than the big things that we, that we consider the big things that we may do for ourselves. All of those last 10 nights of prayer, in the month of Ramadan, you have all of that stacked on, all of that Quran, you have like all, you have all of this reward waiting for you. And it's not to take away from any of that. But when you add a layer of mindfulness in your intention behind anything that you do, even the way you carry yourself, if, if you are walking from here to your car, and in this walk, you had a small interaction, small conversation, you did something that... That, that had an impact on someone's mind, on someone's heart, then those few walks could have might been heavier for you than any tahajjud you probably prayed the night before. Because we don't know what butterfly effect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ Anyone who does a grain of sand. Did you, you know, like, you ever, you ever put sugar in your tea and sometimes it spills on the table, on a clear glass table, and you see one little speck of sugar? That, that little speck of sugar, if that's how much good you did, you are going to see that. How do you see? I'm standing here. My mizan is right here in front of me. How am I going to see that small peck of sugar? It's not going to be a small peck of sugar. It's going to be this huge mountain. A huge sugar reserve. Because of the intention behind the small little thing that I did when I did it. And it's about preserving that as well. And this is not something that, you know, to have this thoughtfulness and not want anything in return. And this is with the 38 seconds that I have left. I want to share with you two verses from Surah Al-Insan. These Surah Al-Insan, a.k.a. Surah Tuddaha, is a verse that the Prophet ﷺ has encouraged us to recite Friday morning in Fajr. That's what makes Fajr long in some masajid on a Friday morning. Because Alif Lamim Sajda and Surah al are recited. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala paints the picture of sincere people. And this is Makki Quran. Innama 
ويطعمون طعام على حبه مسكينا ويتيما واسيرا Allah is praising the believers they feed for the love of God miskina the poor the orphans and those who are held in captive now people who are behind bars who are in captivity they are there because they did something all right they contributed to society negatively that's why they are behind bars whatever it's easy to feed a friend it's easy to feed family it's easy to feed the in-laws right because there is a reciprocation in that but to go and feed a poor person who may not be able to reciprocate to go and poor an orphan who cannot and will not reciprocate and someone behind the bars who should i feed this person in the first place to feed for the love of god in those situations that's a belief and allah quotes okay quotes those believers inna ma nut'imukum here you go while you're feeding inna ma nut'imukum li wajhi allah we are feeding you for the sake of god end of story la nuridu minkum jaza'an wala shukura listen we don't want anything back from you we don't want anything back from you wala shukura imagine they're saying oh may allah nothing oh thank you but i don't want to hear it that's it let me just do this and leave it's so hard it's very it's very hard folks to do something good towards someone and feel okay with them not thanking you imagine someone imagine imagine if like there's a brother who came and welcomed me over here and when i leave like imagine like okay i thank you for having me imagine i did none of that and i just walked away man i don't know if we're going to invite this guy next year he's so arrogant he's such a diva right it's hard to not receive appreciation and acknowledge we're wired for it but this is where the mind takes over the emotions the heart takes over the emotions where you put allah like you know what i don't care if anyone else is saying thank you or not allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already said thank you because he is the shakur and the fact that i was allowed to do this good was already him telling me that i got you so sincerity is the end all when it comes to leaving behind a legacy anything that we do in life in any phase that we are in life it is a must to make sure that we keep allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his pleasure and his service alone as our driving force behind everything that we do because if there is no sincerity there is no legacy jazakumullah khair assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh